A man who was taxed with gas every time he shared an office or van with Kimmel. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. You got to get on. That's just what I'm going to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Bull Brian. Please, and I quote, shut the fuck up forever. Thomas Jane. Oh, man, I got to talk to him about that scene in Boogie Nights when he great went up scene. to the house. Uh, it's just like... All time of, great scene. All time in terms of just con- contained No, scenes. the fireworks scene of the drug deal gone wrong. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, f- I forgot that was him. And he's beaked out the whole time. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, so good. Great. So good. So right. All right, so we'll talk to him about all that stuff. Uh, so, uh, lots of weird we- weather, a lot of thunder, lightning. Yeah. Now, I'm up in the foothills, and um, it was hitting real hard in the foothills. I didn't, when I was driving out here, the roads seemed dry and so on and so forth. Yeah, we haven't forth. gotten any rain. But uh, thunder, lightning, big time. I don't know if you guys I got it. I think we got five minutes of solid rain this morning, like on the west side. I was out did, walking. Did you beautiful. get the thunder, lightning starting at uh, five, report, six a.m.? Reports are no thunder and lightning from from my wife. So I was, was going to say when she was up yeah. for Orange Theory. Was a yeah. Well, she's in the Highland Games now because they've <laughs> opened chair tossing. <laughs> she's not thrilled that I showed that story. <laughs> well, it's never going to go. It away. makes us love her even more. I it, I look. I admire spunk, <laughs> passion, and passion. Um, so the. <laughs> Thunder and the lightning was just going off at, uh, you know, starting, I don't know, 5.30, 6 a.m. Well, the water restriction started out here vis-a-vis what you can water your lawn, when, and for how long. So five good minutes ahead of yeah, decent rain, it. and we'll take it. Where is Phil, where does Phil stand on thunder? Does well, he even I was, notice? I was going to, I was going to say that. So Phil gets up, he sleeps with Sonny, then he gets up at, uh, I don't know, eight, and then he moves his way into the living room, and then at some point, he just lays down by the living room slider door that leads into the backyard. For he second wants, nap? He wants, to take a, he wants to take a leak, and then he wants to sun himself. Oh, and um, so a couple of things, because I, I, I did write down Phil. Um, the thunder and the lightning definitely woke me up in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. which is something um, I don't normally look forward to. But I realized that the distinction is this is force majeure. This is act of God. This is not man-made. When I get awoken by the backup beeper mm-hmm. at 615 mm-hmm. on a Sunday, like, nee, nee, and I'm like, oh, who the fuck Why? is driving their yeah. fucking truck at this? Or the leaf blower, the whatever it is, that's all induced Mm -hmm. by man. You know, this is act of nature and God. And even though it's equally as disruptive, it doesn't land the same way on me. I still wake up, but I'm sort of, oh, this is is nature. This is kind of... You know, it's the difference between a, a school shooting and a uh, and kids being in a bus mm. that went over a ravine or something. It's like one they're, big they're, difference. Either you're not happy about either one, but one really mm. sits with you as oh my god, where do, wow. where are we as a human as a race? You know, and the other's like, well, shit happens, mm. man. So that's what my realize like my reaction is sort of almost no reaction to being jostled out of bed at uh, four in the morning. But because Chris said he got it in Long Beach between 3.30 and 4 a.m. So yeah, maybe... and I'm a super heavy sleeper. It takes a lot to wake me up. That was the loudest thunder that I, I could remember. Really? Yeah. I oh, cheated out of this. In the foothills, I mean, bolts and cracks, and it was violent, which I enjoy. <laughs> and uh, No trees split it's... in half? No, but at some point, Phil needed to be led outside, mm-hmm. and then Phil walked outside. And it was more lightning and violent, ear-deafening thunder that came behind it. And Phil took his place out on the lawn, laid down, and didn't didn't budge. Wow. I'm starting to get worried that he's deaf. No, no, because he he hears it. He hears the dinner bell. If if Sonny says, uh, you know, you would, it's din 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 or whatever, he's up. If if there's if you so much as take a spoon and clank it against the side of a bowl Hmm. in the kitchen, and he's on the other side of the house, he'll He'll come trotting in. He thinks something's going down. So he has very keen hearing. He's just so detuned that he just sort of lays there in the middle of the yard while thunder and lightning is all all going off around him. He's Buddhist. Then I just thought to myself, yeah, that's his wiring. And then I realized, 
Oh, that's us too. Mm. I, I know people, not as it pertains to thunder and lightning, but there's people that, you know, you can drive with them. You know, somebody's moving into your life, like, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, like, mm-hmm. boom. Like, what, what, what scares me the most about driving with those people is not the car that's going into my lane. It's their reaction yep. to it, which yeah. is big and over the top, or a car backfires and they jump, yes. or you just come up, you come into the same room they're in and like, oh, whoa, you know, it's like this, this weird, super easily tuned, tightly wound. Yeah, tightly wound versus a very detuned, you know, Sonny's a very detuned guy. I'm very detuned. Others are wound up a lot. And, and same with dogs, you know, my, mm-hmm. a Phil is just Completely, he's on one side of the spectrum, completely and utterly detuned. And then there's the other side, which is they need the vest on and, and they're under the sofa. Remember when it became a thing, because I'd never heard of it before, where uh, dogs and cats are being put on antidepressants and like mm-hmm. on people medication? Funny, the people were never super chill people. Yeah, I was going to say. Like, it turns out most of my cat's also on this. Yeah, you know? I, I think it's a there's a self-selecting sample. Yeah. One. I think there's a lot of projection with pets and kids that parents that aren't detuned do mm. is as well. Mm. And maybe we saw a lot of it in COVID, you mm. know, a lot of kind of transference. Oh. Projection and reaction. I mean, pets will pick up on your energy, right? So if you're agitated, whatever it is, they're going to be a little more prone to that. Yeah. I mean, Phil famously laid out in the backyard while a guy took a power wet saw with a diamond blade on it, literally just cut around him. Or was it, Chris, was it a jackhammer? <laughs> he was laying out there while someone was busting up a slab, and he was uh, laying uh, 14 inches away from where the guy was jackhammering, and he couldn't he couldn't bother to be moved. Be more like Phil. So, uh, Doss, I saw you raising your hand because you got dog. Yeah, I, I'm, I was wondering if maybe it's a Labrador thing, yes. because for the longest time, you know, there's a shitload of illegal fireworks around where I live. Um, New Year's in the 4th Jewish of July. neighborhood. Yeah. And Boo mm-hmm. has never had a problem with loud noises. Mm-hmm. Never had a problem until she just turned 13. So Boo, it's starting Boo, to... All lab? All lab. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's definitely... It's just starting to get it. There's definitely a chihuahua on a lab <laughs> <Yeah>. wiring, <laughs> but there's also kind of a wiring in just even amongst the breeds, even inside of the breed. Yeah. Like, like... Phil is super chillax even for a lab. Right. But labs are definitely. And then you sort of get into breeds of yeah. people. Some yeah. are a lot zestier than than others, I'll, I'll say euphemistically. Here's what a dunce I am. I got up. Maybe it was because <laughs> of the uh, the thunder and the lightning, but either way, I, went, I, went, I had to go pee, went to the bathroom, and I saw a flicker, which now makes sense. Putting two and two together must have been lightning in the distance. I thought someone was in our backyard with like a flashlight or like a phone light or something. And I'm like, it kind of jostled me awake. I'm like, what's going on out there? And of course, I went away, and now I feel like an idiot. No. We have yeah. Phil sleeping with what Chris is calling a wet bandsaw. But uh, that's I, what it's labeled as. Oh, why? Why can't we label? No such thing. Yeah. Well, you'll you'll tell Not us. Not really. No. Nobody. Nobody has a wet bandsaw. Uh, he could be. How how? What's the square footage of that lot? He could be anywhere. It's like a white anyway. noise machine. <laughs> yeah. I'm inside the house and the door's closed. That is loud as shit. And when we head out, you're gonna you're gonna as I get closer, you're gonna hear this thing fired up. He's also sleeping on top of a broom handle <laughs> as well. It doesn't seem to bother him. Get it, Phil. Uh, there's so many other choices. Oh, oh my, my god. god. Nope, nope. Now Phil's looking now he's at me. Looking up. They're still. What, what? What do you want? I'm relaxing. Yeah. So they're I operating a, a circular saw with a diamond blade on it that's two, three feet away from Phil, and Phil's sleeping on top of a mop. <laughs> he's not moving. <laughs> so that's a good dog. Yeah. He also has a lot of extra flesh on his lower side that it will absorb a pine cone. Sure a conch shell or anything he falls asleep on. But he doesn't even, he's not even looking at the proceeding. He has his back turned to a, to a large saw that's sawing behind him. And he's not interested or moving. The head's back down. Yeah. What gives? 
What? Does he like being around random people? He and- loves randos. He, okay. he lo- anyone who shows up to work, he is heading down that hall well, there and you go. hanging out with them. If the makeup lady shows up for some Tucker hit, he's sure. at the door. He's waiting on her. I don't know if it's all about food, but certainly comes across as uh, exquisitely um, social. Wow. All right. So that was uh, that was our fill with That's the uh, wet circular. Saw. Um, sorry. That was a bad saw. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there is every tool exists. So there's the possibility no, okay. of something called a wet bandsaw, but I do not own one. <laughs> I do not know anyone who owns one. And I've never said wet and mm-hmm. bandsaw put together. Well, the ground looked wet. Maybe but it was a wet uh, picture with bandsaw. There are wet mm-hmm. tile saws, but again, that's a diamond circular blade all right so uh gina well i want to say uh for the early show on friday is it Mm -hmm. yeah uh dickie barrett mighty mighty boston's is gonna be in denver he just hit up mike he's like i'm gonna be there and uh so he'll come up on stage and we'll talk to dickie and all that he's been dealing with over the last uh, few weeks and months especially with all this covid stuff so that'll be an interesting discussion also just Dickie's just the sort of epitome of a knock around good dude. Like there's no better hang than Dickie. Funny, but doesn't try to impose it on mm. you. La- big laugher, tons of great stories. Uh, just a great, anyone who's ever seen the boss sounds just a great lead man, a great showman, a great performer. So uh, nice. we'll, uh, you can look forward to seeing Dickie up there on uh, Friday at the, is it the 7 or 7.30? I'm not sure. 7.15 Mountain Time. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'm guessing that means a 7.30 start. The Are but they off an hour and 15 minutes? Let's get there early. All right. So now, Gina, you saw the play, King James, yes. which I didn't know about. Fantastic. I will be shocked if it doesn't head to Broadway, if it doesn't win. If there's not a lot of Tony buzz around this thing. It's this great play called King James. And yes, it, it has a lot to do with LeBron James. And I can't remember the name of the writer. I can look it up. But uh, he's he's written um, other stuff as well. But this is basically about two dudes. Disrespectful. I know. Who meet at a bar and one of them's got, uh, you know, Cavalier tickets to sell back when, when LeBron's a rookie. And they're negotiating over the price. And long story short, it sort of blossoms this friendship that parallels. Najeev Joseph. Thank so, you. So my he did, yeah, he's he did a Bengal Tiger and. Bangladesh. I, he, he's 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 pretty well known in that uh, circle. But Is this a musical? No. Oh, thank God. And uh, <laughs> it sort of parallels LeBron leaving Cleveland and you know their friendship going you know through uh, ebbs and flows and fucking fantastic. And it starts with a DJ, this this cool chick who's like off to the side. And so you go into the theater and it's like all this great music. Oh yeah, and uh, th- it's like the lights are going like you know. Like the like the, like the team's coming out, you know, like the what, spotlight's going crazy. What, what theater? It was at the Mark Taper Forum downtown, mm-hmm. and it was fantastic. And it's still running for like another two weeks. I highly recommend it. It's re- we were so impressed. I brought my husband because he likes musicals and stuff, but I like to, you know, I don't want to force him to sit through anything he wouldn't like. So this was one of his Father's Day presents, and I thought it's called King James. It's about his favorite athlete of all time. Let's go check it out. And it was absolutely beautifully acted, funny, well done on every level. Wow. Really, so it's really going, you good. You think it's going to Broadway? I, I would be shocked because this is previews. And I told Andy, who doesn't understand the rele- you know, the, the significance of this, I've only done it a few times. I'm like, do you understand that when this goes to Broadway and this becomes huge and this one wins a Tony for Best Play, you will have seen the original cast like, I know that doesn't mean much to, to the likes of you, but it's a really big deal. So if you're in L.A. and, and you got some time, these guys are fantastic. Um, Chris, take a dive on Mark Taper, because I've lived here my whole life. And I uh, along the commercials I watched with the Super Bowls of motocross mm-hmm. and uh, the Orange County um, Pomona Fairgrounds sure. with the dragsters and all of the married of things that I was never going to go to, they would also have plays, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 
Uh, Lenny and his amazing Technicolor uh, jock straps <laughs> coming to town at the Mark A Perform. You know, everything was at the Mark. T- well, the, the Amundsen. Back then, I think it may have I been. think you're right. The, the Amundsen, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, all and the Mark Tape are all right there together. We would never go right. as a group. Right. But there was a lot of bands and yeah. plays and events Good that were point. taking place at the Mark Taper Forum. Yep. The Mark Taper Forum was not built when they built Staples Center or Crypto mm. Land or whatever yeah. it is now. My, I, that that I remember as a young person. So I don't know who Mark Taper I'm this guy. Was. I have no idea who this guy is. He must have been extremely wealthy yeah. and philanthropist because uh, the uh, the imaging center where they do MRIs and oh. everything at Cedars is the Mark Tabor Imaging Center. Wow, he got he, had, he wanted to little it legacy. Around, yeah. yeah, and the, it's great inside the theater because it's it feels very seventies modern. Mm-hmm. Like it's beautiful with lots of like mirrored walls, Built, and circular things. Opened in sixty seven. I must buy have, it. They must have broke ground in 65 or whatever. Uh, so it's it's my entire childhood. I've been hearing about the Mark Tate perform and what, what goes on. Have you literally never seen a piece of theater or performance and that's it, Mark Tate or Dorothy Chandler or Amundsen? I'm sure if you talk to a few people in my life, maybe like <laughs> someone like Jimmy, he'd go, what are you talking about? We saw Pip in there in <laughs> We saw him moving out there. <laughs> yeah, like he, he, yeah, he might, but... I highly doubt out. it. I don't. I don't know. Is it a two thousand seater? The, well, the Mark Taper is like a, a smaller circular, almost sir, almost theater in the round. Uh-huh. The Amundsen's the big one. That's where we saw Book of Mormon and uh-huh. that kind of thing. But also, j- actually, do you have a picture, Ben, of the plaza? It's worth it just to go sit in the plaza. They got the big, beautiful fountains, the splash mm-hmm. pad. It's it's. You feel very fancy there. Seven hundred and forty seats. So it's a that's it's, a smaller. It's theater. a smaller, smaller theater. The Dorothy Chandler is the Opera House and the. Amundsen the big, the big. Auditorium. I try not to support the arts, I know. as you know, and especially ethnic, I you know, understand. arts. I yeah, try not for to sure, for sure. <laughs> support that. But uh, hey, the, maybe I'll give it a look. The plaza is beautiful. They yeah. have a big stage set up for free concerts. So Mark Taper, this guy must have been around for a while. He was a real estate developer. Oh, okay. Chris will, will tell us. Oh. I guess his name's on everything. Dawson or Will. Dawson will. He was born in Poland on Christmas Day in 1902. It was then part of the Russian Empire. Moved to uh, England around his 30s, had five companies there, moved to Long Beach in 1930. Wow. Hmm. And then he just started building projects. Hold on. When did he die? Oh, my God. 19, 1994. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Long run. But he, if we reanimated him and brought him back to current <laughs> L.A., he would never stop throwing up. He'd be like, what did I give you this money for? What the fuck happened he, to this place? He founded Biltmore Homes and began building suburban housing for returning soldiers in Long Beach, wow. Norwalk, Compton, and mm-hmm. Lakewood. In all, he built 35,000 houses for low- and middle-income people as part of the largest housing project in the United States. Fucking communist. He would I'll also head down to building and safety and try to pull a permit <laughs> and, and then begin vomiting <laughs> a, again. But... Uh, and then there he is. Philanthropically, Mark and Amelia Taper divided mo- devoted much of their time to transporting hundreds of Catholics and Jewish children out of Nazi Germany. This guy's a hero. The Mark S. Taper Foundation was established in 1962 as a f- 1952 as a family foundation and remains active in philanthropic giving. Wow. Um, I just hope there's no statues of him anywhere because at some point it's that is going to have to come it's down not, because he had a lawn unsavory. jockey in 1947. <laughs> All right. Um, some point we're going to have to shift from slave owner to had a lawn jockey in front of their house yeah. because we're just not going to be able to go back far enough to right. get to the slavery days. All right. Uh, we also, speaking of uh, that, Juneteenth, they have a traveling sort of Juneteenth monument. There's a <laughs> sculpture, a monument that's been... Traveling around, I think it's in New Orleans now. It was yeah. in Los Angeles. Oh, I don't think about Philly. this. Philly. It's, yeah, it's called All Power to All People. All right. Then. Here it is. Seems all right. It's oh, my. No, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. That's that's like uh, from Spaceballs. Uh, Spaceballs. We ain't found, found shit. shit. <laughs> a lot of people are relating it to space. It's a giant hair pick. With, that, with the black fist on it. Wow. Which, my, by the way, my dad had. Coming yep. up, when you bought a 
hair pick back in the day. They just put the black fist, power fist on it because they didn't they didn't see my dad coming. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> so uh, I well, first things first. Um, whenever you do like all power to all people, like all the time, that's when you go, I care about the children of the world. It's like, right. all right, <laughs> so Same. do we <laughs> now. Now you got to get more specific. So I, I don't like that. It's all people all the time, but then, um, the Afro pick is sort of weird because it, it, it sort of excludes a lot of black women who mm. wouldn't use the Afro oh, pick. I mean, there, the, you know, there was Shirley Hemphill sure, from, yeah. from Good Times. She definitely picked it, picked it out. But uh, I'd say the ratio between the women and the men had to be had to be ten to one. It, with it the, fell with out of pick. fashion for women. Yeah, yeah. and uh, also I don't know if it's a fitting tribute or tip of the cap culturally. To, like it's a comb. <laughs> it has to do with your hair. I guess. <sighs> I guess it's just one like. Uh, for uh, yeah, Jews, Italians, you know, uh, those of us with curly hair, we're supposed to be included in this, maybe? But this is sort of a June wow. teen thing. My thing. first reaction was, this is bad parody. I, uh, it's, it's a bad joke. Yeah. We've now entered into the realm where the Onion and the Babylon Bee are no longer... You can't tell the difference between what is parody and what is actually a seven million dollar state sponsored, <laughs> government funded Jesus. actual attempt at something, but it's a a giant pick. And I'm also wondering about the vetting process. Like you got you have to run this up a few people's flag. Couple yeah. you? Have like, passed yeah. around. You know, like, hey, I got an idea for a giant sculpture to commemorate Juneteenth and it's a <laughs> It's a tip of the cap to the African American mm -hmm. community, and it's like, uh, so what is it? Is it the is it the march with the um, Martin Luther King voting or voting rights? Yeah, or, uh, yeah. I've been there, done that. No, nah, this is a comb. Uh, uh, this Obama is hair. holding a comb. It's called Afro American. Mm -hmm. All right, let me finish my thoughts. So they um, wow unveiled the giant pick with twenty eight feet tall. <laughs> I know that I'm not, I shouldn't be speaking for anyone else's community, but it feels a little disrespectful. That's what I thought. It, it doesn't help yeah. is about all, is about all I got with the, uh, with the Afro pick. <sighs> but listen, you know, if they're coming for Jefferson, this gives Whitey something to go after too, you it, know? It does look Photoshopped like an Onion <laughs> article. <laughs> speaking of that, uh, James Woods, I had to retweet him the other day because like what you said, he said, as the Babylon Bee slips to second place in the satire marathon, the Atlantic had a headline that said, the heroism of the heroism of Biden's bike fall. The president gracefully illustrated an important lesson for all Americans. When we fall, we must get back up. That's fake, but that's funny. <laughs> that's it's not real? No. It's oh, not? Shit. I know, but it's funny. Oh, I have heard it. It, it looks yeah. like from the Atlantic. I know, it's photoshopped. God damn it. I know. Thank, I know. You. Funny, Thank you for telling but me. But funny. Yeah. On Biden's fall, uh, he blamed it on the toe traps toe that are on He's the like clipped in? Or? Yeah. I, he wasn't clipped in, but it was a toe cage. Okay. It's a toe cage. Clipped in is, you know, the bottom of your uh, yeah. of the ride. Now, okay. you still have to negotiate that, uh, but as I... Once said uh, during the uh, filming of Ordinary Extraordinary with John Ritter to the guy who's going to do the double flip on the BMX bike that had the buddy pegs sticking mm -hmm. out on all four corners. Why bother? What? You're cruising around at a very slow speed on, you know, this is not the Tour de France yeah. here. You're just yeah. kind of puttering around. You got the Secret Service guys puttering, you know, jogging next to you. Why the bike with the clips? I mean, that mm. that's something to navigate. Yeah, you, you, that's you, another unnecessary problem. detail. It, Especially when you're at a stop. It is, you know, it is necessary for competitive, competitive, level. and or just higher level. Yes. I I need to pick up the pace. I'm trying to tuck in and draft the guy in front yeah, of me. Beat We're a, going beat a time. Yeah, it's really in the in the sort of beach cruiser department. Or just sort of bopping around with the wife in the Secret Service, it is an extra hindrance that could only cause trouble. And there's really not little to no benefit at this level. Why? Why is that even on there? I saw it. And I'm always kind of wondering, like, I would be the guy to go, I'd be the Secret Service guy going, is that Biden's yeah. uh, Huffy over there? <laughs> yeah. What's with the toe cage? Yeah. Get those out of came with the bike. I'd be like, yeah. pop them off because well, but they you can't, look so professional. You can't get cool. stuck in them, and you will you will go down if yeah. if you do. 
All right. So um, let's see. And at that age, for real, that could be a that could be a hip replacement. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm I'm surprised he he popped up as as fast as he did. All right. Uh, should we play Mar? Let's see. Uh, Thomas Jane's going to uh, zoom in right at two o'clock. One thirty. Oh, yeah. Sorry, screwed that up. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see what I wrote down to talk about. Uh, who is this Mark Taper dude again? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to buy some time. All right. Look why, up Dorothy Chandler. Why don't we? Well, let me hit a spot here, and then we'll uh, talk to uh, Thomas Jane. Who? That scene, I'm trying to think, uh, Brian, you'd be a better guy to go to for this, but, you know, I'll buy you a little bit time. Sort of. What do you want to know? Mount Rushmore of scenes. Okay. I love the glorious bastards at the, at the dairy with the milk. Well, you're talking, okay, this is good because you're talking about tense scenes. Or, or not. But well, just your two examples so far are pretty tense. Thank you. Or not. It can just be. The, the funniest mm. exchange, the scene that you thought, you know. I remember seeing Boogie Nights for the first time, and I remember seeing that scene and being and fucking white knuckling it. Like I was like, I don't know where this is going. I yeah. don't know who's gonna shoot first. I don't know what. I don't know what's happening in this scene. But it was a, uh, it was it was highest possible stakes while still being grounded in reality, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. there's like, you know, the world's going to end or you got to press the button to stop the nukes. That's all fine. But this was like, oh, f four or five guys in a drug den uh, up on uh, uh, whatever it was. Uh, Those were up in the Donnas, up in Hebrew Heights. Mm. And that's where that stuff did yeah. take place. And I recognize that house. Like if you went up down, up in Studio City, up in the hills, I used to go up and down there all the time because yeah. I had friends that are up there. Saw it at Pack Theater, and I was that's when I was like, this movie just went to the next level, like like the best possible iteration of this movie. The genius of that scene were the firecrackers. Yes. That <laughs> totally was, unnecessary <laughs> and totally brilliant. <laughs> totally unnecessary. I, I would have never thought about it in a million years, but it ratcheted up Completely. the tension unbelievably. Yep. It, it, the funny thing about Thomas Jane in that role, it's the same thing as like Matthew McConaughey in uh, Dazing and Fused. You're like, that's a guy, kind of creepy, not super hot. You're like, that was Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you look like Thomas Jane. Her, but and then he's you're like, like no. Nope. He's mm -hmm. scheming the whole time yep. with his eyes. He's doing, that's really great acting in that scene because he's not saying anything really, but he's just scheming yep. with his eyes. Well, let's just watch two minutes of it because it is so good. In the Rick Springfield song. Do you remember is, who the drug dealer was? Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina. Yeah, he was yep. awesome. It's open kimono <laughs> robe. And I love, I don't know why, I love the throwaway line of Rick Springfield comes on and that guy's, a, you can stop it. That guy's a friend of mine. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. But get on it, everyone. This is, this is an all-time classic. All right. Let me tell you about uh, Keeps. More than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. Keeps, a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair convenient. Virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door. Every three months in discreet packaging, low cost starts at just 10 bucks per month. Treatment plans are typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. Proven results keeps as more five-star reviews than its competitors. And you can uh, check out the before and after photos on their website. Look, prevention is key. Treatment can take four to six months to see results. So act fast and get going with keeps, right, Dawson? If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Adam to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps.com slash Adam. To get your first month free, keeps.com slash Adam. Well, the aforementioned Thomas Jane will be on the program right after this. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. I know Kung Fu. If you said The Matrix. I know Kung Fu. You're correct. Now, back to the show. 
Thomas Jane is zooming in. The movie Murder at Yellowstone City. It'll be in theaters and VOD tomorrow as you hear this. It also uh, has Gabriel Byrne in it and uh, Richard Dreyfus as well. Good to see you, Thomas. Hey, fellas. How are you? We're doing well. Congratulations on uh, all the success, all the movies. Um, followed your career for, for many years. And... Uh, even back to uh, Deep Blue Sea. Love that movie. Which is a good movie uh, yes. that people kind of uh, forgot about or write off. Very enjoyable. Well, you know what happened with that? The uh, Deep Blue Sea opened the same weekend as this little tiny piece of shit called Blair Witch Project. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> a Blair Witch. Do you remember that? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that it was not the Deep Blue Sea. Blew the studio away because they just they blindsided them because it was the first sort of internet based uh, uh, campaign that really got butts in the theater and the the studio didn't know what the hell to do with it. So uh, they actually beat us. They opened number one and Deep Blue Sea was number two and that kind of changed the industry right there I mean, that it was, weekend. It was a phenomenon, you know what I mean? Like you, you got you got swatted up by a tidal wave. No fault of a fine movie like Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, yeah, a good metaphor uh, to use as well, yeah, right. the tidal wave. Yeah, but Blair Witch right. had a huge budget. You guys were working <laughs> on a right. shoestring. <laughs> How could you compete? Oh, we, we struggled. We struggled with the whole damn thing. I appreciated People. that Deep Blue Sea used Mako yeah, sharks yeah. versus the Great White, which is always the, the default shark in any, yeah, any movie. Yeah, right. And I remember the studio saying, listen, don't say the J word, Jaws. Don't <laughs> mention Jaws. Nobody talk about Jaws doesn't exist. There's no such thing as Jaws. And I never figured that out. Like, wh why? Why are we doing it? Oh, because of the Mako show. We have Mako sharks. I get it. Um, Richard Dreyfus has a nice role in uh, this latest film of yours. And I'm trying to think if I've seen him in much mm. lately. Has he been? Has Rich has he? been. Rich has been taking it easy, you know. He's uh, he's earned it. He's been in some of the greatest movies of all time. He's a he's a spry, uh, witty, seventy uh, something year old guy now, and uh, just as good as he's as he's always been. Loves the work, loves his job, um, and I think he's just sort of slowing down a little bit, but he's still got it. Well, I guess it's a, a nice testament to the script of your film because he probably doesn't need to work. He's probably getting a little choosy at this stage in his career. And the fact that he decided to come out and work with you is a nice testament to the material, I assume. It is. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a strong little movie, you know. Uh, Westerns are, uh, against everybody's better judgment, making a comeback right now. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, everyone, every... Every couple of decades, somebody declares the Western dead, but it still keeps chugging along. It's a great American myth. You know, it's a, up there with jazz and baseball is truly American creations. Uh, and they've, they've, of course, beloved worldwide. Um, but, you know, we've we, like other genres, I guess, has their it has their ups and downs, um, probably because of that, you know. So you came out, uh, I'm, I'm reading here that you dropped out of high school and came out to Los Angeles to act. So you must have been 17, very young when you came out here. I turned 16, 16 in India. I was, uh, I dropped out of high school, started going to a little acting class that was above a liquor store in Bethesda, Maryland, studied with a great old timer named Ralph Tabakin. Ralph was in silent uh, stuff. He would, he did radio, he did stage, and he was just a good, you know, one, one of those wonderful character actors. Barry Levinson, who's also from Maryland, used him in somewhere in every one of his movies up until Ralph died. And uh, Ralph gave me the courage to, uh, he said, you know, you're, you, you're an actor, you're an actor. I was 15, I dropped out of high school. So these, he called me one day, I was sweeping floors at a Heckinger's, which is a department's a hardware store and the pay phone. And he calls me and he says, uh, Tom, there's these Indians in town. They want you to come and audition for their movie. <laughs> I 
said, Indians? Like, like cowboys and Indians? He said, no, like with the dot, with the dot on the head. <laughs> and he sent me down to audition for this it Bollywood film. And I got the part and we uh, traveled all over America. And then I split for India, lived there for six months. Did another Bollywood film when I was there. They wanted me to stay. They said, you know, you be the American. You be the American in our Bollywood films. But I I had a hankering to go to Hollywood. So I flew back home, packed up my stuff and, uh, and drove to California. I turned 17 in San Francisco. I thought that was a good place to study acting. I was wrong. <laughs> and uh, and then drove down to L.A. I turned 18 in L.A. And uh Kind of been here on and off ever since. You were in India when you were 16 and a half? I sure was. Yes, sir. I was there. I was 15 and a half. I turned. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I my don't... parents were flipping out. They didn't know what to do sure. with me. I Look, uh, I don't think younger people know how crazy exotic travel was mm. when we were young. It was off the table. If, yeah. if I had a friend that went to Yuma, Arizona for three days. That exactly. it was a big deal. Like, tell us the story. What do the airport smell like? <laughs> you know, like yep. India and, and maybe somebody went to England or France. India was crazy, exotic, yeah. unthinkable. Like it was much closer yeah. from the dawn of civilization where we could record people moving Taking a boat across the Atlantic or the Pacific was we were much closer to that than yeah. we are to to India going to India in nineteen you know eighty one or eighty five or whatever whatever it was it was yeah. bizarre and Something exotic like yeah I'd never been outside I mean my my grandparents lived in upstate New York and we'd take road trips but outside of that I'd never been I'd never been anywhere. And uh, and the landing in India at the airport was like landing on Mars. The smell, you know, the dirt, just the beautiful, beautiful people. Be and everybody staring at me because I had blonde hair and I was white. And they literally, the children would gather around me and just to touch, just to touch my clothes. I couldn't go anywhere because I had this gaggle of kids that would just surround me all the time. Um, it was, it was, it was life-changing. I tell you, I guess the main takeaway from India was that I realized that the American way of life with, was not the only way to live that they in India at the time. And this is pretty much before Westernization. I mean, you could barely use a telephone in India in the mid eighties, um, Everybody spoke a different language. You had to repeat yourself five times and, and the connection was terrible. It was a little it felt a little bit like maybe living in the 1920s in, in America. But the main thing I that blew my mind was that their value system, they valued family and friendship above money and things. So they were incredibly happy, most of them, because they had family and friends and community and eating. And that was what they put first. And then the jobs and the careers and all that and the making the gathering of stuff came. It was secondary. It was uh, the flips, the, the reverse of the, what I've been kind of taught. And that changed my life. Was that there, and eating with my hands. Was there <laughs> any sort of chaperone who was sort of assigned to you in any way? I mean, you were a kid. Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I didn't feel like a kid, but I was a kid. I mean, I look at my daughter, you know, she's 19. And I think, my God, I can't believe what the things I did that when I was 15, 16 years old. Um, so it's kind of, I would never let my daughter. Do that. Right. <laughs> well, well but yeah, no, you're, you're on your own. I was on my own and treated like an adult and treated like a professional and, um, you know, really changed my life. It was quite incredible that and learning all the singing and dancing songs that I had to do for the Bollywood film. Is any of that stuff sure. still out there? Can we YouTube it? Can we stream it? Is it, uh, I think you can. Yeah. I, my, uh, the mother of, uh, Harlow, my child, uh, the mother uh, of uh, her for my 30th birthday hunted down a copy oh. <laughs> of 
of Pavamati Sanjo Ragam, my, <laughs> my Indian debut, and played it, you know, in sort of the background, played it in, uh, at our, at her, my birthday party. <laughs> and it was, it was something to see. Let me tell you, I played myself at 16 and 40. So they gave me a mustache. Oh, nice. Gave me a comb over. And, and I had to learn Telugu, which is the language the film is in. I had to learn it phonetically as if I had grown up and married this Indian woman and spoke fluent Telugu now. Well, some good uh, news. It, was, it, is, it, was, it is incredibly findable because I'm looking at it right now. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, yes. No, no, go ahead. I, I'll, uh, well, involved. I was going to say it, it yeah. took uh, it took a lot of maturity to at 16 to go. I know I'm kind of adored here. Uh, part of it's the novelty of the blonde hair, but it's still nice to have the kids at the <laughs> ham when I go out in the street. And then there's plenty of work for me here. But I got That's I right. got my sights set mm-hmm. on Hollywood. Seemed like a lot I of did. people hang hang around and hammer checks and be adored for a few years before they before they cut out what what made you do that uh gosh that's a good question i i had a girlfriend at the time and i was in love with her and i i knew i wanted to get back to her but i didn't stay you know once i got back i was there for a couple of months and i packed up my stuff and took off again but i knew I just always knew what I wanted to do. And I knew that, you know, I was never going to Telugu was a really tough language to figure out. (laughs) So I knew I was never going to really be an Indian Bollywood star. You know what I'm saying? And your dad or mom is a genetic engineer. I'm reading here. Yeah, my my dad started three companies in in uh, biotechnology. He got in on the ground floor in the late seventies, in the seventies, uh, doing uh, biotech. You know, and so he knows he knows all those, and he sold the equipment and the technology that scientists would use to uh, to do their genetic research, and it was the dawn of genetic research. So, Did uh, uh, quite. Quite the guy. Now, so he seems pretty studious and academic, and you know that's a guy who's not pursuing the arts per se, but the science. Uh, mm. You heading off to India? Like, did 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 your friends come over to the house and goes, Thomas? Can Thomas play? <laughs> no, he's was he taking a bath? No, he's oh. in India. <laughs> in where now? Indiana. Taking a bath. We're going into the tenth grade, <laughs> Mister Jane. Yeah, no, he's in India. When's he coming back? No one knows. No one knows. Hard to say. Hard to say. I mean, he did he object terribly to that? Yeah, it was uh, not a you know uh, it was not a discussion that I was going to allow to happen. I I actually just um, and I and I regret this. It wasn't the proper way to to do it, but I just took off one day. You know, and kind of wrote him a letter and said I'm in India. Um, I knew, you know, I, I knew that the resistance was going to be pretty harsh. Uh, sure. so, and I had my, my heart set on doing it and I went and did it. Um, you know, my, my, my dad appreciates the wherewithal that I had now, but at the time <laughs> it was, it was pretty dramatic. So when you came back and then you took off again, where'd you take off again to? Well, you know, the Indians are uh, notorious for their negotiating skills. So in lieu of paying me money to act in this film, to be the lead in the Bollywood film, the Indian producer said, listen, we're out of money. But the RV that we use to tow around the, the crew and the everybody around the country to make the movie, I don't need it anymore. So it's yours. <laughs> so. Sure. I inherited I inherited this RV. Um, I, you know, me and my pals had fun driving that down the turnpike and, and hanging out for a while. But I ended up it ended up breaking down on the New Jersey turnpike, and I ended up finding a mechanic that would trade it. He goes, "All right, I'll I'll take this off your hands, and I'll give you a '69 Camaro convertible in return." So I traded the RV for my '69 Camaro, and I painted it matte black loaded it up with all my stuff and took off for uh, for the West Coast. I took off for the West Coast because I was butt poor and I knew that I wouldn't freeze to death mm. on the West Coast. 
And that's what, you know, it was a choice between New York and go re- enrolling in an acting school there, which I did go to, but they told me I was too young to be a part of the adult program. And of course I wanted the full-time adult, you know, full experience. And they said, no. So I took off and went to the West coast with about 800 bucks in my pocket. And you did some street performing back, back in the day. He's sparking up. I did just about everything you can. Yeah. I learned, you know, I picked, I I picked up a guitar for about 50 bucks and uh, that was pretty much some of my last money. And I, and I picked up a few, a couple of chords and I would play it on the street busking and uh, you know, people would, pay me to go away essentially <laughs> where did you where did you do your busking where what corner what was the populace oh, I, uh, you know I, that would be that would have been when i got down to la i got into a really the uh, kind of hotel that doesn't exist anymore it was called the white horse inn uh it was on western uh around sunset western Bo- uh, uh, avenue boulevard and yeah. sunset and it was this old hotel probably built at the turn of the century and it was one of those ones you could pay by the month mm-hmm. and i was eating by there and i would walk around sunset boulevard hollywood boulevard around there you'd walk into hollywood um Santa Monica Boulevard that had a wonderful theater row. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's these 99 seat, 50 seat theaters all up and down this one stretch of Santa Monica. I think some of them are still there. And uh, I would I would nose around there and see if anybody needed help or if I could help build a set or if I could hang some lights. And and I got involved with a little theater community in uh in Hollywood. And that's where I got started doing plays and got seen by a casting director who started, they call it side pocketing, you know, yeah. uh, like they wouldn't, an agent wouldn't really sign you, but they'd slip you stuff every now and then and send you out. And, uh, and that's how I started getting my first gigs here in, here in Hollywood. It, uh, it strikes me that, uh, sunset and Western Ooh. was also the home of the pussycat movie theater back oh, in yeah, the day. Yeah. And That's uh, right. I'm not yeah. saying you're addicted to pornography, but it gets pretty hot <laughs> out here and those things are air conditioned. Yeah. So yeah. nobody, well, exactly. exactly, nobody would yes, judge you I, if you slid in to just oh, cool down I, I for seven or eight hours <laughs> on a Thursday <laughs> afternoon. A that, that, Which, one, uh, yeah. One of the last pussycats was, was there huh? by the children's That's hospital. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. And you used to be able to do that. Once you paid your ticket, you could come into the middle of a movie and then and then just sit there and wait and catch the first half of the movie. That was a thing that that people used to let you do. And and, and they pretty much leave you alone. I've actually done that. I have hung out in, in movie theaters and slept in the seat and just caught the movie, watched it a couple of times just to... Uh, just to get off the street for a while. Did you ever go into that particular pussycat theater? You know, I, I actually, that's funny you say that. The pussycat theater was literally right next door to this hotel. Mm-hmm. There was a bar. There was a bar. There was the pussycat theater. And, you know, we used to hang out in the lobby of the hotel. There was one black and white television in this tiny lobby, you know, it would be the, si- the size of a large bathroom at a hotel, this lobby. And it would have these old chairs that were broken down and like an orange colored couch that only had one well, of three legs. And and we would sit in there and stare at this black and white television that had, you know, it was the kind you turn with the dial. It had six channels. And they None of them came in very well. And the the uh, usher of the Pussycat Theater used to walk over in his uniform in, you know, after he did the tickets and then everybody and the show was playing, he'd wander over and sit down and we'd all watch this black and white television together, watch some old some old cowboy show or something. I remember that. You're bringing back memories. This sounds so yeah, He looked a little bit like Lurch. <laughs> he, he looked like Lurch from the uh, Adams family. You People, know, he was, uh, he was suited, suited, right? He had the he had the red usher <laughs> outfit on with the cat. And the white gloves, but none of it fit right. And he'd, he'd sit there. He was, there is well, was speak, life. And people don't realize that even in the mid 80s, it's like 
half the country was still living in the 40s, you know, yeah. black and white TVs, yeah. cars that were carbureted that broke down all the time. <laughs> you know, poor people yeah. were still living like it was 1947. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of whatever the microwave ovens no color tvs no reliable transportation (laughs) no hand-me-down clothes and 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 kitchenware that's how my van was no credit cards no no nothing it's just kind of cash on the barrel head watching old black and white zenith (laughs) tv no no central air Maybe a maybe a window mounted unit, you know, buzzing away. The refrigerator was no different than the right. one the grandma had yeah. back in the day. Like might it, have been the one the grandma. Yeah, had it was just living living in the forties in the yeah. in the eighties. But speaking yeah. of uh, speaking of you porn, had sterno the sterno the little uh, you know you couldn't cook in your room, but everybody had a little sterno stove. <laughs> it's a camping stove, mm-hmm. so you'd, you'd use that to cook your breakfast. It's true. Damn. Smoke wherever you wanted. <laughs> Uh, speaking of uh, pornography, uh, Boogie Nights, we we just went over how much we loved you in that in that movie and the scene with Alfred Molina and the firecrackers. And it's one of my favorite all time scenes. And you were just put on a clinic in that because you you looked high as a kite and you looked simultaneously super aggressive and powerful and nervous as shit and beleaguered (laughs) at the same, same time. Um, yeah. How did that whole thing come about? It's one of my favorite all time movies. Well, I read that I, you know, somebody slipped me that script and I read it and thought it was fantastic. But that scene in particular really stood out and they were having open calls, you know, for looking for actors. And, uh, and I specifically said, I want to audition for Todd Parker. I, I really like this part. It's really cool. And I went down there and got myself an audition. Um, and, uh, ended up getting a call back with John C. Riley and, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it was just the three of us. And what the director, Paul Thomas Anderson was doing was, create you know he was trying out different combinations of actors to see who would fit together and uh, i remember that audition is it just kind of devolved into an improv and we started improving and 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 it, and it, it all just kind of came to life and uh you know paul was wise enough to hire the uh, us all as uh, as being that kind of gang um he used to run around i there was an office I guess it was the production offices and he had one of those big, uh, he used to record them on tape, the video cameras with the tape and he'd just run around and film us in character, you know? So we did a lot of, I guess you'd call it uh, rehearsals like that, but it was really just Paul chasing us around with mm-hmm. the camera. He probably still has that somewhere that, that videotaped footage of, of the actors who'd be running around the production office in character <laughs> Doing goofy stuff. John C. Riley and Philip Seymour Hoffman weren't householdy names no, or anything. No, not Philip Seymour Hoffman for sure. Back then, no. were they? You so. might recognize Philip Seymour yeah. Hoffman from like Twister. Um, I was gonna, yeah, or I was gonna say the the Al Pacino, Sense of a Woman. He right. was one of the the kids uh, in that right. movie, but he wasn't a household name at all. And what was John C. Riley up to back then? Did you know those guys? Had you worked with them? Oh, no, no. We, we all met on that show and, you know, we hung out for a long time. We were, we were pals or, you know, uh, we, you know, you get together in New York, there'd be a certain cafe where all the actors would hang out and they'd show up and we'd wander in and out or maybe go catch a, the second half of a theater play together, or we'd be auditioning for the same Broadway play. And, you know, we, we were sort of like this unit of, young hungry actors that were out there hitting the streets and uh we um over the years you know and then we all got married and had kids and <laughs> went uh, went about with our careers but th- those were good times if i may I'm, I'm a big thomas jane fan i'm a big fan of your career i loved your cameo in scott pilgrim versus the world uh, highlight of the movie thanks. really enjoyable my favorite thomas jane movie and role is the mist. You are fantastic. Mm-hmm. The movie lives and dies on your shoulders, frankly. You're great. Mm-hmm. Marsha mm-hmm. Harden's great. That's a Frank yeah. Darabont movie on a Stephen King novel. So the same uh, duo yep. that brought mm-hmm. a Shawshank. But the famously, mm-hmm. I'd, he- I'd always heard the ending was reworked from 
the novel to make it more bleak. And that is a bleak ending. I don't want to give away what happens, but what, what was your understanding of how that came about? Yeah, that was a script. Frank and I had met over our love for comic books and comic book artists, and we were both huge Bernie Wrightson fans, and we'd both become pals with Bernie. He's one of the, ma they call him the master of the macabre. He's just a, just an outstanding illustrator and one of one of a, of a group of guys that that I used to run around with. And that's how I got to know Frank, because we both had a real passion for uh, and love for the art of illustration. And Frank's this script showed up on my porch one day and uh, Frank said, hey, you know, I, I want to make this movie. See what you think of it. And I read it and it had that that ending. And I said, man, this is this is amazing. You know, of course, I want to be involved. But 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 how are you going to pull this ending off? Uh -huh. And he said, well, we got it with the Weinstein Company and they offered me double the budget if I changed the ending to a more <laughs> to a less bleak ending. They said, listen, with this ending, we can only give you half the money. And we all agreed that uh, we could make the movie for that much and we could pull it off. And uh, and that that's what we all wanted to do. Everybody was pretty adamant about about keeping that that ending, which was different than the short story. And I had dinner with Stephen King and Darabont while while we were shooting, I think. And uh, King said uh, he said, you know, we asked him, you know, so what do you think? We kind of changed your ending a little bit. And and, uh, and he said, you know, if I'd have thought of that. I did I don't that's what that's the ending I would have wrote. <laughs> that's the seal of approval. It's incredibly memorable, of course, but all, I can see how it would have hurt business. It's not a it's not an ending you're gonna tell us, oh you gotta see the mist. It ends on such a great note. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the sad part about that was let me the Weinstein company decided that the perfect day to release the mist <laughs> would be Thanksgiving Day <laughs> weekend. Hmm. The sure. weekend known for families yeah. eating a big, de uh, you know, uh, and then going out to, to the movies. It was a huge family weekend. Not not the greatest time to release that film. I'm seeing a pattern developing yeah. here with the movie release. Blair Witch uh -huh. 2 drop that weekend. <laughs> Thomas, uh, let me give you a plug. Murder at Yellowstone City. It's uh, in theaters and on VOD tomorrow as you hear this. Thomas does not make bad movies, and his streak is still alive. Always good to talk to you, my friend, and I, I hope we can get caught up whenever you have something else to talk about. Oh, that'd be great, fella. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Good stuff. The great Thomas Jane. Thank God I know where all the Pussycat Theaters are. <laughs> Sometimes I have to run out of my car and check sure. my uh, laminated map yeah, with yeah. the red dots on it. You hide this in the Thomas Guide? Sprung, yeah. sprung to mine. So all right, is it yes. literally by the where the Children's Hospital is now? I'm thinking of Sunset and Western. If you're heading toward Western on Sunset and you pass the Home Depot, which yeah. wasn't there, but I think the Builder's Emporium was oh, on the other side. Right. Got it. Yep, you get yep, to yep, Western, yep. you make a left, and you stop and pull your dick out because it's right. right you make a little jog you're right and you're right there i see now i don't know if they obviously by the pay less the other one which used to be the guild it's kind of one of those it's kind of interesting so um north hollywood if, if you want to just talk in in terms of like cycles North Hollywood was like a, a nice little suburban, anywhere kind of middle America, you know, middle class mm -hmm. folk kind of environment. Um, and when it was, it had the uh, Guild and the El Portal on, on mm -hmm. Lancashire, where NoHo mm -hmm. is now. And they're both big, big high ceilings and big chandeliers and very 1930s, mm -hmm. big gilded era of, of when they would really build a theater versus the, you know, 18, yeah. you know, box. cinder block boxes. Yeah. And so there was a guild in the El Portal and the neighborhood started to turn, went south, Lancashire went south. And how, how you know it went south is the guild it turned into a pussycat. God damn it. It's also oh, weird. Water. It's also weird when the porn theater's majestic. Look at this. Look at this turn of the century sconces. I'm beating off. <laughs> look at that crown molding. I mean, it was, oh, a, a gold leaf. That's wow. not crown molding. 
I mean, it was it was majestic. Big wow. balcony up top. Not we don't sit right under the no. balcony. Oh, no, 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 no. And uh, it's funny. The porn theater never had handicap seating. Mm. You'd think. You'd think. I had a friend. Who, I, I had a friend who ended up getting a job as as the ticket taker there. So oh, that, what a day for you! That was gold or some other color for me. So that turned into so. The neighborhood was nice, and it was a big, beautiful guild theater. The neighborhood went south. It turned into a pussycat theater. Later on, they resurrected the neighborhood, and now it's just like a big industrial. Yeah. Uh, not Mixed industrial. Use. It's, I, I think they build it like the Hewlett Packard building or oh, something. So oh. it, it came back or or something or it's a, a they busted it up and put a bunch of sushi places but or it whatever follows, but it, it follows the trajectory now it's yeah now it's just corporate whatever yeah now they're doing wood fire pizza right, or something right, in right, the right. space that it was so if you just kind of follow the theaters okay. you can follow the neighborhood of course the pussy cat on santa monica right 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 mm-hmm. by boys town mm-hmm. became the Tomcat? Tomcat. Yeah. yeah. yeah they know their the audience. Tom, right, they finally right. got so to it. You can you can figure out how a neighborhood You're is right. going by what's going on with the theaters then and and now. And yeah, it seems so weird and quaint in the forties. Those theaters must have been built. And then uh up the street, the El Portal, which we've done some live shows yep. at, uh, that hit the skids for a while, and then they brought it back as a live music and uh, theater venue, I think. So okay. they don't, they don't we, show... We did a podcast there early yeah. on in the podcast. In 2016. Done, it was the same weekend as uh, my anniversary done, show. Like, your brother was there. He. Wh- how do you remember that? How do you... Miss you that? <laughs> can't. Does it still haunt your dreams? Still scared. Yeah. Yeah, so he... <laughs> I was like, Chrissy, put the chair down. <laughs> He's family. He's family. Right. She was lying to you. Keep your distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done, we've done podcasts there. Yeah. I've done uh, stand up shows there. I think Sarah Silverman shot a special there. If, oh, I, wow. if I somehow recall, you can kind of tell by the seats. This is uh, us uh, up there with Soledad stage. O'Brien. With Soledad oh, O'Brien. My. Yeah, so they brought that place back and now they're doing, and I think, oh, uh, Reynolds. Um, What's her name's mom? Uh, Debbie Reynolds. Debbie Reynolds was doing like her live whatever, oh. whatever show mm. there for How a did while. I miss that? Yeah, you did miss that. <laughs> Damn. All right, let me tell you about uh, Geico. Like to save a little money on your insurance? Of course you would. Who doesn't love a deal? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for everything, Geico can help. Insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, RV. Even homeowners, condo, or renters coverage as well. And you can save because they got specials and they got discounts. And you can bundle those coverages as well. Plus, you add the easy to uh, easy to use Geico mobile app for 24 road 24 hour roadside assistance. Switch to Geico, it's a no brainer. Switch today. See just how much you could save when you switch to Geico. All right, uh, let's see. Comedian Hannah Burner is going to join us. She's a comedian, she's a host, she's a tennis player. Second tennis player in a row to join the show. We'll talk to her right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Adam, Chris, Colorado Springs. Things to do before you die. Crack a burner phone in half. Throw it in the garbage can. Flip up your collar. Walk away. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Hannah Burner, comedian, is going to join us in a second or two. She's running just a second late. We have uh, more to discuss. Um... On the mist, was it? The uh, mist, yeah. So I mentioned a Steven Spielberg, uh, Spielberg Stephen, Stephen King. King novel uh, adapted by Frank Darabont, and Stephen King gave him the thumbs up, like for, like Thomas Jane said. It's streaming on Netflix, so everyone can watch it if you have Netflix. It's a good watch. I felt bad. I didn't want to say it in front of Tom. Thomas, while it is a very good movie. 
you can tell that the budget was slashed because the effects, it's about an alien kind of creature invasion and this group of townsfolk uh, sequester themselves inside of a grocery store. Really good cat and mouse kind of movie, but you can tell they're, the special effects are frankly below average for 2007. You know, it, it doesn't look good. And you can tell they probably had budget issues, but otherwise a really tightly told story. I was thinking as I was hearing that, as if, if I was a producer, anybody who brought me a story, I'd go, look, we can't go with your ending. But if we do, we'll just have to cut it, mm -hmm. the budget in mm -hmm. half. I mean, if you want to stick to your artistic integrity and dance with who brung you mm -hmm. and you're someone who doesn't value the almighty dollar mm -hmm. over artistic integrity, then then we can do that. But. <laughs> But we're gonna, yeah. you know, obviously, what artist is gonna say no? Look in your children's eyes at some point. But <laughs> all I, it's your choice. It's completely your choice, you know, to either, you know, be a a, a celebrated thespian or a sellout. A but sellout. It, it, it's 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 your choice. You want to be, you know, um, would you like to be Meryl Streep or David Hasselhoff? But huh? I'll I mean, let you. I'll let you think about. It, but I'm I understand committed. we're going to have to cut it in half. <laughs> I'm committed to my vision. But on the other hand, I really need our money to yeah. make these special effects look good. Well, you take your time. <laughs> yeah, you probably could get everything whacked in That's half good. if you just kind of did it that That's way. That's a good way to frame it. Mm -hmm. You and Sonny should watch it. It's a. Uh, it's worthwhile. I, I haven't seen it, and. Um, Stephen King is very all over the road mm -hmm. for me. Like, oh, I really love The Shining, uh, Pet Cemetery, not so the much. You know. Man, you know. Misery. Yes, yes. Misery is one of the good ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also altered a bit from the book. Right. Well, I guess so. I'm not really familiar with Stephen King's writing as much mm -hmm. as the movies that have been made of his, mov of his books. But The Mist is, I would call it solid. Mm. Uh, well, eighteen million dollar budget, and it did fifty seven million really? bucks at the uh, box office. Okay. Actually, I wonder. We should all guess what the Rotten Tomato score is. I've seen it. I don't even know. I would guess. Oh wait, let's, let's hold uh, on. Hold on. We'll take your word for it. I haven't seen it. Based on something, and I don't know how much Stephen King gets in because there's stuff they love, and then there's there's misery, right? That's yeah. Stephen King, and everyone loved that one, and then there's stuff they hate so i don't know if they... this is 2007 i feel like by then more good stephen king had come out mm -hmm. i think all right gina i didn't see it but i'm gonna go ahead and guess 72 79 i hope it's higher 63 hope it's lower <laughs> we have a five point deduction all right <laughs> and the winner with minus five because i've seen the movie the mist is fresh at 72. I'll take oh, it. Oh, I'd like that to roll over to the next game, please. Nice. Funny, the audience at 65. You know why? I said lower. ending. The ending <laughs> is not audience friendly. Interesting. Now you want to see it. What was the ending? I'm not going to give it away. Uh, but can it, you tell us a, what the book ending was? I don't even know, actually. Oh, okay. But uh, it's, it's extremely bleak in the movie. Okay. All Depressing, right. I would go so far <laughs> as to say. Well, young... Beautiful comedian Hannah Burner is uh, joining us, and I'm told on my screen she's uh, walking into the studio, so we'll bring Hannah in as she is uh, placed before us. She's uh, I'll give her plugs now, and we'll save a little time on that. It's going to be at the uh, Warburg uh, Lounge in New York City. That's coming up June 28th at Troubadour. That's a, quite a v storied venue out in West Hollywood. That'll be uh, August 7th. Helium Comedy Club in uh, Portland. We've been there a few times as well. And that's coming up August 10th. And that's where you can find Hannah Burner. So we got your plugs in. Put your earphones on. And I got you. <laughs> how are you, Hannah? Thank you for having me, guys. My pleasure. It's Thanks for pleasure joining us. It's a pleasure to be us. here. Yeah. This is a little weird for me because my wife loves Summer House. Your wife has amazing taste. Yeah, I know. She's a big fan of yours. <laughs> and she, she loves uh, the whole... I've seen every episode of Summer House via, oh because my of my God, wife. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Uh, hmm. I am not familiar with Summer House. Tell me all about it. Well, it is a reality show that I was on. Mm -hmm. I was on a... I wanted to be doing entertainment. I wanted to make people laugh. And I got sidetracked for three years on a reality show. <laughs> and it was about New Yorkers who work during the week. And then on the weekend, you go to the Hamptons. Oh, yeah. And you like yeah, fucking it. fight. It's right. Everyone one just of those. gets drunk and, and fights. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, had, I had put three years in and then I got 
engaged and then they tossed me. Mm. Did uh, did they feed you booze They're lost. in those environments? <laughs> I mean, you want booze mm -hmm. because it's just a lot of stress and um, there's definitely booze always available. And I do think drunk people thrive in those situations. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. And it is, it's a good set because mostly drinking, you know, while filming is frowned upon in this city. <laughs> Unless it's Summer House and Match Game. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Match Game. It's sickening what they do. I've done Match Game a few times. You have? Uh, yeah, and they want everyone to have a cocktail mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they just feel like, oh, it's going to get body and blue and right. we're going to have fun, you know. Yeah. But what they don't tell you is, they, you know, they film it. You know, one in the afternoon. So yep. it's a little different vibe yeah. when you're drink, you know, day drinking. I was very into espresso martinis. Sorry. Oh, boy. Because, oh, my God. Because we're filming for a long time, and then it's 10 p.m., you're at a restaurant, and I'm like, I have to have a little fight with someone. I need some caffeine mm -hmm. for this. Right. And then, so you get drunk, they get you hyper, and you will have diarrhea at the end, but it's it's kind of a an explosion that's worth it for the mm -hmm. end of the night. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, agreed. You, you well, feel uh, light and listen, diar ready to dance. Listen, diarrhea gets a bad rap. I mean, diarrhea, we need to normalize diarrhea a little more. I, I concur. <laughs> Bad publicist with diarrhea. Gonna, I know, they need new PR. Their marketing this, team's shit, no pun intended. It's going to dovetail nicely into <laughs> me taking a long walk uh, last night and thinking I wasn't going to make it back oh, to the no. abode. You had to hot foot oh. it. I, I did, but here's the... Uh, so here's the thing, and we'll we'll go back to that. Oh no, it's okay. Diarrhea gets a bad rap, but 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 like what got you to diarrhea is excellent Mexican food. Sure. Yes. So I say it's worth the price. Yeah. Yes. You know, no one ever does that. Yeah, you you buy a ticket, you know what the show's going to be. Yeah, it's like yeah. Muhammad Ali had some brain damage at the end, but yeah. what what do you do? statues of the man. I yeah. do know some people who are like vegan, they eat so clean, and then they're like, I don't know why I'm backed up. I'm like, go to Taco Bell. That's right. Just go to Taco Bell. Yeah. It's a beautiful release. Some would say an orgasm through your butthole. Oh, wow. Mm. That's Where's their new mark. Tell that to Christy. Yeah, that's a, could that be down. good for Write that down. Okay. Write that down. Right now. That. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, you can use that. <laughs> I don't need credit. I was walking through the neighborhood uh, last night and just felt some churning going mm. on mm -hmm. at the end of like an hour and 15 minute mm. walk. It was dark. I was oh, on no. a cul-de-sac. Oh. And I was like, I think I can pull one of those female jogger situation in between the cars did you shit on garagos's lawn <laughs> his wife He'll sue. It up. that's right <laughs> no but i did run into garagos walking moments moments earlier and i had a thought like can i make it back to my house and then mm -hmm. that's the worst thought because now you're on the clock yep, yep. you know what i mean yep if, if you have this thought a mile away, you're like, I don't even think about it. You're not going to make it <laughs> right. back to your humble abode. But the, the next thought is, is I'm only about 300 yards from the, from the front door. Yeah. Shall I go for it? And I started thinking about the uh, woman at the donut shop. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Tim Hortons or whatever. Dropped one of them. the deuce yeah. and threw it at the guy. Right. Ever see that? That was more I, functional. I, I feel like the throw was unnecessary. Yeah. Like we wouldn't See, have been mad if she. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, if you're gonna go, go all in. <laughs> if you're gonna shit somewhere. <laughs> my thing is sometimes you get a little risky. Like, could I just let out a little oh, yeah. air? Yeah. And my advice is, don't be a hero. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a dice roll. You know, don't be a yeah. hero. Hold it in. Yeah, I agree. And um, I do think it's the ultimate equalizer, though, especially in this town. Sure. Doesn't matter how successful you are, how much money you have. You're gonna lose to mm. diarrhea eventually. Well, and mm. when everyone was on Atkins, yeah, <laughs> oh, specifically, yeah. I've never heard so many shit my pants stories yeah. in my entire oh, life. Oh my god! I really? That's the Atkins thing. That was specifically because people were eating like just like melted blocks of cheese and like <laughs> Atkins protein bars, and left, right, and center, I was hearing about people shitting their pants. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> well, let's keep the digging. pants industry let's, was happy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's keep digging around. <laughs> <laughs> to me, you guys all tell me what what does it okay. because <laughs> chemo. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> what does it now? Everyone makes the joke. Oh, I had Indian food or I had Mexican food mm -hmm. or curry or something. For no, me, neither here nor never. there. My thing is, is I love summer fruit, and if you throw a couple of nectarines around, oh. I'll eat four of them. 
Like fibrous. Eh, you Naughty. give me a sack of ra- <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> you give me some potassium, I'm in. <laughs> I'll eat a banana. But banana's not gonna do it. You give me a sack of rainier cherries and I'll just sit there and I, I won't rainier cherries and pistachios. There's no end, oh, there's no right. place where you stop. You God has not made enough to where you you'll find right. your limit. So I'll fire off a bunch yeah. of those, and then at some point <laughs> have a cup of coffee, yep. and then I'm like, all right, now I'm going for a hike. <laughs> yeah. And at some point, that's what it's. It's a lot of fruit <laughs> that yeah. that does it. it water soluble and fiber. A lot of fiber. Yeah. What do you got? I think it's kind of mental. Mm. I don't mean to be like the Brene Brown of IBS, but I feel like. <laughs> It is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is. It's like when I'm anxious, Mm. everything goes through me. It's kind of like you ever like before a show, you're like, we need to have diarrhea or like before something you're nervous about. (laughs) So I could eat anything. I could eat so clean and nice and and my body will reject things when it's unnerved, when my stomach Mm -hmm. just is turning. Totally. In a bad relationship, start shitting yourself. (laughs) Yeah, so it's about that, Gina. Is it psychological for you as well? Are you kidding? A hundred percent. But when, but from the sliver of time where it's not psychological, (laughs) doesn't matter what I'm eating as long as I wash it down with water. If it's carbonated, rumble in the jungle like chemistry set. Yeah, you cannot have it with a soda. Whatever it is, I may have uh, come up with an invention. I think we can all get behind. Oh boy, (laughs) go on. (laughs) Well. Well, look, if you had a nice house back in the day, and even now, you'd have a bidet. Like, is it be oh, a yeah. separate yeah. separate toilet? Yeah, right? very European. You got enough square footage. You got enough in the bank. You're doing a nice uh, ground up or beautiful remod, and uh, you'll mm-hmm. go with the bidet, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you got the, you know, ass washer toilet. Yeah, I got that good. one. Uh, what about having a standard toilet and a shits blown off the wagon <laughs> toilet like this is litter a little bigger mouth a little it. different slope on the seat <laughs> yeah. and maybe a different maybe teflon coated porcelain yeah. it's yeah. higher up because that's precious seconds grab sitting bars down. Grab, grab bars everywhere grab bar you can bite onto something <laughs> a leather strap built-in overhead fan <laughs> that's good you know what i mean like something pi- piping panic room in, piping yanni just like, someone yeah. patting your forehead yes yeah. wiping the, you down ooh, when the, like an airplane that got suction pressure yeah. actuated yeah. seat yeah. feels you come down on it it is uh uh, fucking all hands Turbulence. on deck. Right. <laughs> that is because the problem with the standard toilet You have to is, get naked for it. Yeah. Oh, obviously. <laughs> the standard toilet is for the standard dump. You yeah. get, try to hit it with the diarrhea on it's, the standard. It's checkers it's not, and chess. Yeah, it's not yeah. built for it. No. This is like the toilet Esquire, better than the common <laughs> toilet. Yeah. And I, I feel like if I had the exploding <laughs> toilet, like this is the big, big timer toilet. First off, what would be the danger if you just had a nice solid BM and, yeah. on the big throne? Yeah, you know what I mean? Yawn. Except like if you first start dating, there's no like casual way of going to the big toilet. Like, uh, oh, it's just going to be a quick yeah. one. You're like, you're in the big toilet room. And yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm just testing it. Can it be behind the regular I, toilet? I have like a turning like, library? I have it like the bidet, which is just adjacent yeah. oh, so to it's the, adjacent. Oh, okay, okay. okay. still okay. need to explain it. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like he'll hear the noises regardless. Yeah, people are going like to walk in and go, what imploding. is that second toilet? Like I thought it was a bidet, but I felt vacuum pressure when I sat on it. <laughs> it does it for you. <laughs> That's a good idea. And what else might we have? I, I would say it probably came with like a inspirational plaque, like a, something funny and amusing, like the mm-hmm. cat. You could do it. Hanging, mm-hmm. hanging there, baby. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, yeah. You might you can request different things to listen to. It could be Yanni. It could be the squirrels fighting, as we've talked about before. Oh. Or mm. it could be meditation. Like or, you're okay. Take a deep breath. Or metal rock. I, like, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're dying. You're in hell. Something to drown out what's going on in there. Yeah. Or, or something to. Sound. Sound. Yeah, that Brian's right. Drown out because the, there are people outside passing in the hallway. I, but if you're going full Dumb and Dumber, you need psychological help at that point. Like you need someone on your side telling you you're gonna live through this. Yeah, like you could call a friend. <laughs> I also think there should be video just in case you want to only fans it. Like, there's definitely a way. Oh, oh there's a market. Yeah, yeah for, I'm for just the thinking ladies, entrepreneurial think. wise. Yeah, or like a classical <laughs> song that you could kind of participate in, like da 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 da
some of the big crescendo it's to make sure you're It's kind of like you're having a baby. It's like three, two, one, push, <laughs> push. Okay, breathe. Back to your breathing patterns. <laughs> Am I inventing this uh, Maxipata? Is there I a... It does have a seatbelt. Oh, my God. <laughs> Five point I got our brand name. I got our brand name, people. What is it? Heavy Beauty. Oh, my God. It's genius. Wow. It's an ace of work shit right there. Will somebody do a mock-up for us, please? First off, please we, don't. Ain't, we ain't going with white either, man. <laughs> Stains too easily. Yeah, so we could work this out. But, uh, you know, big bore... <laughs> <laughs> little extra water flow. But there's games you could play too, like you could do Mario Kart or something during it, and it'll be mm. leather. Oh, leather, oh, leather yeah. seat, leather back. Yeah, Ple- yeah. pleather Bold, probably. Or ple- pleather, pleather yeah. for the vegans. Car vinyl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an easy cleanup yeah. too. No, that's, we don't want suede I'm... or Alcantara. Nah. <laughs> suede. I'll maybe ultra suede. <laughs> but there is a gold if you want to upgrade. Oh. Mm. Well, sure. The Trump there edition. has to be the Trump dump yeah. edition. The Trump, Trump dump. dump. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was envisioning. <laughs> I'm in the triple deuce club. I, I, as I wrote in my best selling uh, book, I uh, uh, have uh, pooped my pants three times. Three times. Yeah. Lost control. Were any of them not cancer related? No, all, all medication related. No, not food, not them. anything, just the medication. Uh, That's what the, you tell people? That, no, it's 100% true. Is yeah. that side effect listed on the bottle? Uh, Spontaneous shitting? I don't believe it is, although it's a stool softener oh. and a uh, mm. laxative, so oh, it's implied. Well, it's implied. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyone? All right, so I don't respect that. <laughs> <laughs> so best Try I can again. Do, best I can do. Right, it's, it's kind of the opposite of the people like, I've never thrown up because I drank too much. Three really? times, you fool. Haven't? Never. You think this is a brag, but yeah. I'm really losing respect <laughs> for you. Hannah? Are we, if we puke, what, of course. I puked on my bachelorette party. Good. Like, old, that's, skew, old school, like knees on the tile. That's right. what I'm talking nice. about. With some girl crying behind you and Get you're like, it. shut up, I'm trying to focus. I bet you could have used the heavy duty oversized bowl. Yeah, exactly. For that as well. Swipe up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where was your bachelor party? I went to Miami. I did mm-hmm. kind of a classic thing. I, I'm not like big into partying. But then I, I, f- I pretty much got into it. But it's it's very cult like bachelorettes, you know, because mm-hmm. you I sense the power. I had all these women, mm. you oh. know, I got them to a, a secret location. They do all your bidding. They're blacking out. They're just giving me money. Oh, you're like the David Koresh of that. Yeah. Yes. Or the Jim Jones. Yeah. I went fully. Yes. Like they would do anything for you. You're the bride. Yeah. You're like, take this you poison dim- if you fucking like me. And you if have someone dominion tries dominion over them. Yes. And if someone starts complaining, they're like, oh, do you not support Hannah's? Mm love and they're like no 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 i support it i'm here and everyone wears the same colors honestly it was and you decide the colors right yeah and then i make everyone give speeches about how great i am it's a full cult yeah and also normally if you take a a crown with an inflatable penis on it and say you got to walk through the lobby of the hotel in this bitch most people tell you to fuck off but not now they're like yes and how far wear this bride squad sash bitch yes and you think like oh i would never be in a cult but when your friend chooses you yeah you Mm -hmm. feel like you're part of something bigger and um that's how i got all my friends to miami and and we did unthinkable things. Mm. Ja Rule did come out at a strip club. That was the highlight. Oh, really? Are you guys big Ja Rule fans? <laughs> sure. Until the fire Wish. festival. Until the f- yeah. <clears throat> he got bamboozled. Yeah. He got no. bamboozled. Yeah. You're at a male strip club? It, it's called Eleven. And we, I guess, I guess it's a male strip club. It's kind of one of those mix. Like, it's a party with, like, girls around. Mm-hmm. And we kind of, we had some bodyguards and we were like, any dudes that come, just clothesline them. And it was a very, like, feminist, um, empowering time, mm-hmm. especially the puke part. Mm-hmm. And- <laughs> what about Ja Rule? Ja Rule probably picked a different song. <laughs> How did Ja Rule, ja Rule factor dude, into this? Ja Rule just comes out. And I make eye contact with him, and he starts rapping, and he loves to perform. Comes out on stage? Just comes on stage, shirt off. Yeah. And I I discovered him at 11 years old. Like, my first MTV experience was, like, Ja Rule. And I was like, I'm so naughty. His low voice. And I was just rapping to him, and it was a beautiful full circle experience for me. And was he like booked there, or did he just kind of spontaneously? That's a great question. (laughs) I don't know if he thought it was like an open mic that he just comes on. I don't think he was booked because they were kind of like, Ja Rule's in the building. We were like, cool. And then he made it into his own concert. He's very main character energy. Do you think he's trying to get laid? 
Absolutely. That was such a naive question. I guess. I mean, uh, why I do male comics do what they do? To... Um, yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have many theories. <laughs> A lot are about getting laid. Because women do it for the art. But you look, you can do it for a multitude of reasons. Mostly they don't want to participate in society as we know it. Like they don't like alarms right. and getting up in the morning Crack and taking care of kids and mm -hmm. obligations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. insurance and stuff. They'd rather live a semi-nomadic life where they could see a matinee any day of the week or, or go out to brunch with Sarah Silverman at any place <laughs> on Fairfax when there's no, it's not crowded right. because it's midweek, like midday. This is like getting midday. specific, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of these, <laughs> these guys. Well, there's a crate, like in what universe, like when you think about you know, Jeff Ross or Doug Benson or like the list goes on and on. Bunch <laughs> of guys in their 50s, no kids. Yeah. Never been married. Yeah. Like it, it's. And they have an excuse because they're like, yeah. dating's hard. It with my lifestyle. schedule. Yeah. Right, right. Like I travel so much. So some of it is getting laid. And then the other part is like, I just don't want to live in any kind of conventional schedule that yeah. all you idiots, you know, the alarm goes off and I you mean, get up and you go downstairs and the kids have knocked over the cereal bowl. Like they don't want that shit. Do you have kids? Yeah, I have two of them. It's fucking, <laughs> it's a fool's errand. <laughs> I, they're twins. I named one fool and the other Aaron. <laughs> Aaron's not confused. <laughs> Fool's pretty fucking pissed about now. Oh my God. Wait, so it didn't make you a better person when you had a child? Far no, from it. No. <laughs> Far from it. Really the opposite. Do you know when people no. are like, I now found my purpose? No, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. And then here's a here's a, maybe a rule. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this is a rule. Your kid's upbringing has to be somewhat commensurate with your upbringing, or at least in the same s sort of stratosphere sure. of his general neighborhood mm -hmm. of your upbringing. Because when your kid's upbringing is so insanely different than your own, mm -hmm. then everything bothers you. Oh, you're like these fucking spoiled brats. Right. Yeah, so there's like little things like, I used to have a, you know, go kart in the back of the shop, and I, I'd see my kid and any kid. I think Jimmy's kid. They just like walk right past it, step over it, and walk over there and sit down and like start playing with their phone. And I'd go, it's just a waste of my time. You just stepped over go kart, son. And it's like, yeah. So I saw it. when I was eleven, if I someone had a go kart, I'd be like, who's this? Is does it run? What's going on? Like, Let's go fire on. it up. Let's do this. You know. So you're that dad. that's like. Back in the day, we used to have to walk 10 miles to get to school. Oh, very much. Oh, very much. <laughs> they, no, because all the all you do is get ridiculed for yeah. that now. Yeah. But but the, the crazy casualness that they can approach, let's just say eating out. Mm. You know, like you, so you'd say, uh, let's go out to eat. And they go, okay. And then you go, I'd, we're going to eat in Chinese food. And they go, no, I'm not in the mood. And you go, oh, come on, you can order anything on the menu. And they go, yeah, have a good time. And you're like, would you, in a, what universe would going out to eat be on the table mm -hmm. and you telling your parents to pan, pound sand? They go, if it's you're, not hibachi, I'm not going. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was a, that was a, it's your birthday and that's yeah. about it. It was a very rare occasion. Or it's your cool friend's birthday. Right. More yeah. likely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Half. <laughs> half drunk smoothies all over strewn about you know what i mean like when like when when you were a kid was there ever an instance if you found a half consumed root beer mm -hmm. Sweating on the counter and me oh. not there, it'd be like Adam's been abducted. Right. He was shot or abducted. It's like there's no you leave half the a glass fucking is still root sweaty. beer and just like walk away from no, a no. smoothie or but, they'll have milkshakes that they say, like, I drank half, I'm I'm done with it. My Italian I'm grandpa lactose intolerant. You're right. <laughs> my Italian grandpa would say that for dessert or whatever, right, take as much as you want, but finish every bite. Take right. what that you want, but rule. eat what you take. And I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think you feel you 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 feel bad for them too, because like the littlest thing used to br bring you so much joy, where they like have so much stimulation right now that it's like almost hard to find. You know, just on the subject in terms of stimulation, <laughs> my dad segue. for a small period of time smoked cigars. Just on the topic of cigars. 
we had the cigar box. Mm -hmm. The cigar box was used and reused, was adorned with with colors and paints and made into a place to keep your matchbox cars or your stash, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. later. Then there was the aluminum cigar tube. Oh, Mm -hmm. boy. My my dad had the cigar. You could have a cap. You could screw it. You could unscrew it. You could hold it underwater. It would pop up. Yeah. Even the band that went around the cigar, hey, I'm getting yeah. engaged. You know, like, <laughs> I was going full Tom Hanks on an island with cigar. Somebody uh, tweeted me, Chris, you don't have to find it, but there was a time when Band-Aids came in a metal box oh, yeah. with a flap a flip. snap oh, lid. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. you don't yeah. throw that box yeah, away. That's a big ticket <laughs> item, man. I have that. It's the size of baseball cards. <laughs> right. Keep my baby up, whatever. It, it was a box. It was yeah. like, we were trying to... Make toys yes. out of containers. Oh, yeah. Give me that pallet. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a good time this weekend. You take all your teeth you lost, put it, you never know yes. when you might need them. Everything went, <laughs> everything went from, went, at some point, it went from sort of baseball card container, tooth, or whatever. It turned into a stash mm. place that came stash for, box. Yeah, came roaches and right. joints and, and stuff like that. But yes, it, there is was a lot of joy through sort of uh, found fun. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now it's just all, you know, go on Amazon, mm-hmm. get the deluxe laser tag mm-hmm. thing, shows up nine guns and 15 vests, mm-hmm. you know, and people the next are day. running all. Yep. And, they're, and by the way, they're done with it 10 minutes in. Yeah. Yep. But it reminds me almost of dating, how like back then you had to like call someone's house and it was a whole, th- you had to go see them and, I heard my parents told me <laughs> if they weren't there, you're fucked. Like, and then now everyone just like swipe, 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 and you're used to seeing hot people all the time. So yes. it's this weird balance mm-hmm. of like, is it too much stimulation that you're not even you're missing a lot of like potential great moments? Oh, like if you took, let's just say you took the swipe technology and you brought it to 1973. Exactly. The average amount of time before the swipe would be nine hours and 21 minutes. (laughs) People just staring and staring and staring. Now it's just like the average swipe is 1.4 seconds. I mean, if they're just, you may stop and look for a few beats on one, but right, I mean, it is under a second on a lot of them. Because there's always more people where I feel like back then, you, you, it wasn't so accessible, so you kind of would get to know people more. Be like, we don't. It takes a long time to meet someone new. Well, and now that's a gimmick on a lot of these dating sites. It's oh my god, this is a really big deal. You can't see their picture. And it's like, well, we already did. That's like the fucking mm. what? What was not the lost and found ad, but the, oh yeah, the back of the newspaper. Seeking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. misconnections. Misconnections. Yeah. misconnections. <laughs> and that's why you know we've we've sort of shamed this idea and, yeah. and said fat to it for so long. But now in in pop culture, the matchmaking thing is a fucking hot genre. Yeah. Let somebody else say, you have three choices. I vetted them. You don't get 80 choices. You get yeah. three choices. And I think there's something very appealing about that to people. Well, in New York City, you'll meet someone and get along with them and be like, this person's great, but I have five more dates this week. Right, exactly. Well, like, you would, I feel like back then you had a good date. You'd pursue you it. stuck with it. You don't have 400 people on your phone waiting. Yep. There is a study, and I'll screw up the numbers a little bit, <laughs> but the study is, is for consumers, when you give people Too many choices. three choices yeah. for a toaster oven, they're happy. When you give them 18 choices, yes. they get really miserable. That's the thing. And why wouldn't the same apply to, to dates people. or You're any so endeavor? You're so right. Yeah. yeah. So we're fucked. Yeah. Right. But we need the one mega toilet. We can't have competition. <laughs> I don't want no. there to be 18 knockoffs. Just on one on gold the, upgrade, on, and that's it. On the shelf. Yeah. Yep. One heavy duty. Get it. Uh, we'll get it capitalized. I know some guys <laughs> from Deep Pockets. All right. Let me tell you about Ultimate Ears. Now, this is an invention. This is technology. <laughs> We're relying on devices and hardware all over the place. But what about the ears? No two are exactly alike, and your ear buds. Well, it might be causing discomfort or pain, especially if they keep them in too long. UE Fits, true wireless custom fit earbuds from Ultimate Ears. Premium sound, all day comfort. The molding experience is fantastic. It used to be, I've got fitted for a custom IFB way back in the day. The tech would have to come out and make a mold of your ear. This is guaranteed perfect fit in 60 seconds, eight hours of continuous playback on a single charge, up to 20 hours. 
with the charging case. And uh, you try them out and you don't love them. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, plus free shipping and returns and a one-year warranty. Right, Dawson? Use promo code Adam at UE.com fits to get your pair of UE fits. That's UE.com fits, promo code Adam. All right, quick break. We're right back with Hannah and the news right after this. A jury has ordered Bill Cosby to pay a woman $500,000 in damages after he sexually assaulted her as a minor back in the 70s. Cosby was not in the courtroom when the verdict was read. That's according to Deadline. Maybe we should get rid of damages, the term. You Why? know what I mean? Well, we got rid of, you know, I'm handy capable. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it was a big thing when he'd say, so they'd go, you're a uh, rape victim, survivor. Mm-hmm. Rape mm-hmm. survivor. Right. I don't like victim in there. But this is you getting paid for damage. Like, ah, her mm. pussy will never be the same. <laughs> Things all fucked up. Can't rub that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> the, the wording is, it's like lawyers come up with that shit. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it you know, 500000 in restitution or, or whatever, I got it. whatever I got it is. It. Damages. It says she, she's damaged damages goods. Damages like she's a car. No, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps we go with punitive. Punitive <laughs> damages. That's right. Something to think about. <laughs> Her badge is total. <laughs> <laughs> Something to think about. I don't like the term damage. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Uh, the victim, Judy Huth, sued Cosby for sexual battery in 2014, claiming the assault occurred at the Playboy Mansion when she was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Cosby claimed his Fifth Amendment right against self in- self-incrimination and did not testify in the two-week civil trial. He was sentenced up to 10 years behind bars in 2018 for rape, but you, we know that got tossed out. So the court said 500? On a civil? Is Wouldn't it have it to be? I mean, it's not a jury. It was a civil no. trial? or Kit? There are civil jury trials. Like yeah. Why does that feel odd? I don't OJ know. Was a, yeah, yeah, you're right. It feels low. You're right. I don't but know. That was we'll my first thought. That. It feels a low for underage raping, half a <laughs> mil. Yeah. I was like, oh, good for that. I think she got her years screwed up or her age screwed up or something. When she and was that... kind of waffling between the two years. Yeah. Mm. I, you know... It'd be fun to interview Bill Cosby. Would it? I think oh, yeah. I, I would find that interesting. I watched his documentary. Oh, oh did. Did, did you, you talk about it? Cosby? Yeah. It was good. It was really, really good because they, they take you on a full journey where like you're rooting for him and then you're like really Very not much rooting not for him. To. Yeah. Like you, at first you're like, this guy's fucking amazing for comedy and so he's incredibly talented and then you're like, oh my God, he's a monster. <laughs> what was very interesting is how they showed little like seeds he was planting like he almost was telling people call those roofies (laughs) (laughs) you put them in drinks (laughs) but he would make like roofie jokes and stuff and everyone's like ha ha and then you look back at it and you're like oh my god he he hiding in plain sight yeah you're exactly he was almost like testing the people like how they felt about certain stuff so it was creepy yeah when you're when you're thinking about something a lot it's hard not to just sort of have it W- in your subconscious, your right. kind of yeah. stand up or your Especially conversations. Especially when you're being quick and, it, and it's right, right there it's right in your at subconscious. The top. Yeah. Yeah. I'd still rather interview Camille. Me too. Because I feel like any any interview you would do with Bill Cosby that you were trying to get him to be at all honest, he would just turn it around on you and tell right. you you're a bad you person. You tried to interview Cosby for oh, uh, yeah, the they, ribs. But they didn't trust that you weren't going to talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Bill Cosby sponsored Willie T. Ribs. Well, this would be on the happy side. The only black driver at Indianapolis 500 or the first black driver. Uh-huh. And he gave him a full sponsorship. It'd be great to hear about it. Yeah, I mean, on the... Uh, Hey, man, uh, give the devil his due (laughs) side of the ledger. He said to this black race car driver, I will make sure and get you sponsored so that you can go to the Indianapolis 500, which is a very expensive endeavor. Yeah. And hundreds of thousands of dollars back then. And so Bill just walked into Coke and Jell-O and Kodak and was like, hey, fellas, I got got a plan. Mm -hmm. Start cutting a check. And they're like, no, thanks. And so all the people said no to him. All his big guys said no to him. And then he went back and was like, well, I, I said I'd do it. So I guess I'm reaching into my own pocket. And he just sponsored him. Th- there's nothing on the side of the car except for the name Camille. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Th- wow. The side of that. It's like a boat. Weird day glow, <laughs> orange and green, really funky town car. You can find a picture. It says Camille. Oh, wow. Wow. On there. Yeah. 
Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, let's move to Deshaun Watson, <laughs> shall we? Oh, boy. His attorney, he's the Cleveland Browns quarterback, uh, he announced this week that, good for him, 20 out of the 24 lawsuits filed against him have been settled. Once the paperwork has been finalized and the money has been transferred to the women, those cases are dismissed. The terms of the settlement, confidential. Everybody just takes their paycheck and fucks off, I guess. That means Watson only has four more lawsuits to settle. Uh, NPR reports that the settlement also comes after the New York Times said earlier this month Watson had booked massage appointments with at least 66 different women over 17 months while he played for the Texans. Uh, the report also said a Texans representative had provided Watson with non-disclosure re- agreements that he would give at the massage. At the massage. It's for women to sign. It's unusual. Yeah, so... <laughs> His, Red flag. His, so he was bitten by his own snake because he does the rub down, roll over with a boner move. Sure. I think. But aren't there places where you don't, <clears throat> well, they'll just do it? Plenty. Well, that's I confusing. Mean, I don't know. Oh, because he wants to feel like he's forcing them. Because there's, I know football players that they love going to certain places and those places love them. Mm. And they do it all the time, three times a week. Well,. You know, I think I think since the Robert Kraft situation, oh. people are scared to go in because I got the ring doorbell right. in there. And so there's a little of that. Uh, he had an M.O., and I guess his M.O. is uh, boner surprise. Oh, you know, he likes the surprise over. factor, yeah. But then, unfortunately, you can't call the same legitimate gal back because yeah. she already surprised her with a boner last time. <laughs> right. So you got to go with a new gal right. because who the hell wow. cycles through masseuses that what way? What an you addiction. Six in like a year and a, a half. True right. addiction. So yeah. on one hand, he could get the new fresh eyeballs in there who wasn't ready for the boner surprise, not mm-hmm. poise. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, now he's got 66 lawsuits or 24 mm-hmm. lawsuits or 28 lawsuits right. instead of one chick with the boner surprise. Yeah, and I kind of, this is a good, uh, this that's a good dessert, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a good example of people like, oh, one person says something and all these dumb bitches like are coming out of the woodwork for their payday. Yeah. It makes sense because if you if that happens to you and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to move on. That was fucked up. Yeah. And then you hear that happened to me. Like, yep. wait a second. And it legitimizes and it, you, it. Yeah, totally. Well, people's argument with Johnny Depp was like, well, no one's ever come out with yeah, this. We, so it's yeah. weird that this one girl has all these accusations. Mm-hmm. Then you look at like Harvey Weinstein. Everyone has the same kind of story right. where he did the right. same kind of massage. So I, it's it goes both ways. Right. You fucking broads can't get a break. See, they're all just one girl. <laughs> yeah. are all, oh, they're all saying the same four. thing. Yeah. But like, these men are simple. They have the same moves every time. Like come up with something different then. Yeah. That's why I say like when you <laughs> cheat, you know, you got to mix it up. <laughs> Adam ate my pussy That's for four hours. <laughs> then nope, he, no, definitely he didn't poured me, me another glass of champagne. I remember him asking about my day a lot. <laughs> was that about Adam Carolla? The only time he oh. stopped eating my pussy She's was to lying. ask me about my She's afternoon. She's definitely lying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you cooked. <laughs> You can't yeah, you, you, you oh fucking skate, right? <laughs> it's true. It doesn't fit the narrative. Um, oh my god! We have a picture, Camille, on the side of uh, Willie T. Ribs's. Oh, yeah, wow. it says Camille Cosby. Yeah. Wow. There it was, and this is later because he didn't have any of those other sponsors. That the he has Camille Cosby twice on the. Uh, Oh, yeah. Side of the car. Little you little you got thing. Laguna Seca later on, but you got to go at Indy. I don't think he had anything, uh, Chris. I think he only had Camille yeah. on there. But anyway. So. Wow. I mean, Cosby was very charitable. He was like loved educating kids. He had a lot of... S- Real philanthropist. A lot of honorary degrees. Uh, yeah, and that's just a completely different side to him. Yeah. Um, well, let's He's talk, multifaceted. Let, let's talk Johnny Depp. I'm glad you brought him up because we, <laughs> love, uh, we love auctions and stuff here and how much things go for. Well... Oh. This trial did him a ton of favors in that department. Um, his memorabilia is being priced much higher than they thought it would. So let's take his scissor gloves from Edward Scissorhands, 1990. Just sold at auction on Tuesday. Now they are expecting it to sell for half of this amount. It sold for over $81,000. eighty one thousand dollars eighty one two fifty. The scissor mm-hmm. gloves. Mm-hmm. Um, that is twice what they thought it was going to be. The recent attention is now also uh, driving up the price of other memorabilia, like his motorcycle in your favorite movie, um, Crybaby. Cry- oh. uh, <laughs> that's Waters. being listed oh. for two hundred fifty thousand. Jesus Christ! You know what? This is actually going to make you happy because he's 
playing. He's a huge fan of John Waters. I hate John Waters. He's getting his star on the <laughs> Walk of Cry Fame. Baby. Oh. He's getting his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Overdue, I say. Really? Indeed, he is. He's going to join. You know what I'm going to do? Yep. Because, you know, at some point they have to, like, bend down and kiss it or get yeah. down on their <laughs> hands. Or there. Picture, uh, Lick it. I'm going to find the guy who would take the big pickaxe to the Trump star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to go... John Waters is installing a new Trump star. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to bend down, and that guy's just going to fly up with rage in his eyes and an ice pick and go right through his lungs <laughs> with pick. it. You might not suspect I mean, John a, Waters is MAGA. Pickaxe. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> yeah. all MAGA. He's at his own expense. He's installing a new Trump <laughs> that's, star. That's very, very violent. I, may I... <laughs> May I posit a, a, an alternative that mm. might not get you jailed? Mm. She should say, if you really want to honor your legacy in the movies you made, um, didn't Divine like eat dog shit at the end of one oh, of the yeah. movies? You should definitely do that at the unveiling. Well, okay. That might Noted. be good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's going to join. I'll just set myself on fire like a <laughs> no, monk that's good. But that would World be War good II. promo for our or invention. Vietnam. Oh, the absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Factor that in. Uh, the class includes Uma Thurman, Mindy Kaling, Paul Walker, Vince Vaughn, Lenny Kravitz, and Ludacris. Hmm? What that's, about them? That's the 2023 the class, stars. basically. Oh, oh okay. Uh, not Ja Rule? I no, Ja Rule didn't make the cut this time. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's a yeah. weird little, and Chris, we pulled it and we looked at it, but I have no idea if we can find it, but it was a, it was a weird little indicator about four years ago that we were kind of jumping the shark in Los Angeles as it pertained to lawlessness yeah. and really, I mean, it was kind of before there was a camper parked everywhere and people were shitting in the park and stuff, <laughs> but it, it's in full bloom now, yeah. us not paying attention to criminality or whatever, but there was a guy who was like the deputy of the police officers union or something like that. He had a name, like he was the chief of the police officers union or something. And he was leaving Craig's or someplace like that. And a TMZ guy went like somebody won at Trump's uh, walk of fame star with a pickaxe and destroyed it. He was like, good. The other night he's like, so, so be it. <laughs> he got into his car and it's like, we still have laws, right? Like there's still somebody with a pickaxe who's running down Hollywood Boulevard who may yeah, like slip he's expressing and himself. hit somebody else with, yeah. I mean, I know you hate Trump, but mm -hmm. we got rules, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have rules. Those for exactly. Yeah, it was the very beginning of us kind of going, eh, <laughs> we don't mind if certain do people do? do certain things. It's artistic expression. So this yeah. is the uh, L.A. Police Commission president. This is like four years ago? Oh. I think so. What, what do you think about the ongoing defacing of uh, Donald Trump's star of fame? I'm in favor of it. You're oh. in favor of it? <laughs> do, do you think maybe they should just remove the star? Is it I'm becoming a public definitely racist? in favor of getting rid of the star. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hey, thank you very much, sir. Have a good night. It uh, Now, look, you, you say what you will, but it does show a temperament toward <laughs> lawlessness. Oh, of, like, yeah. Like, who's doing the long? Who's doing all the looting and the fire burning? Oh, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Yeah. Give him some space. Yeah. Very mafia-esque. Yeah. Like, should we murder him? He's like, I don't know. If you yeah. see him swim with the fishes, don't ask me. Yeah, it's a big... Uh, that's 2017. That's yeah. a tell. <laughs> five years ago. Yeah. yeah, he's laughing. He's in, he's he's for it. He's in yeah. a good mood. He's yeah. all for it. He's like, burn the whole town down. All right, let's do one more. Okay. Let's talk about a uh, new Karen that has... I, you're a married woman now, yes. Anna. So am I. If this happened to me, I'd be fucking rip shit. <laughs> so this newlywed couple has gone viral on TikTok over this video they're sharing of this quote unquote miserable neighbor trying to ruin their wedding. <laughs> the couple held their wedding ceremony outdoors and the neighbor across the street who they just call Karen, she wasn't having it. For whatever reason, she decided it'd be the perfect time to start mowing her lawn, making a lot of noise. The couple says Karen got on her riding mower right as the bride started walking down the aisle, then fired up the weed whacker during the vows. <laughs> not a Jew. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was so loud, people literally couldn't hear the ceremony. They certainly couldn't hear the vows. Um, most of the comments agree that this woman was wrong. And then other people commented, she has the right to do what she wants. It's her property. You guys oh, decide. fuck those people. Thank you. Say, this, those is, people. this is the sort of super I mean, cut that was She's declaring war. Right. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Got to be some history here, right? You'd think so. So you kind of hear it in the yeah, background. Yeah, there's probably more worse. to this story. I mean, beautiful, beautiful wedding. 
Right on the corner. Working as far, as close as she can to the nuptials, right? Yeah. <laughs> In her visor. So there's history here, right? Yeah, there has to be. Someone fuck someone's husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you didn't follow the HOA. What possible rationale is there for doing that? She hates her neighbor. <laughs> okay. She like, hates like her not saying it's right. Rationale. But or maybe motives. she's mad she didn't get an invite. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Looks like a beautiful neighborhood. She's gotta, like, I say good morning to you every fucking history. morning. Yeah, I, sure. And I don't even get an invite. I don't even get some free, you know, clams, some mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mozzarella. The thing about uh, your neighbors and, and all this kind of shit is they can make you as miserable as they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just hope that mm -hmm. they don't want to live next door to people that are angry at them all the time. Yeah. But a lot of people uh, forego that. They're just like, I don't care if the person... Some people thrive I, on it. I, yeah. I, I can't, I can't there's, there's, wrap my head around that. There's a breed, and they're out there, and the numbers are much greater than you'd ever imagine in terms of how many neighbors are willing to just completely forego any kind of decent relationship, go on the war path and fuck your shit. It's up. insane. Cause how many times do you, do you kind of need your neighbor's help sometimes oh, to sure. have someone looking out or it can you close the garage you. Yeah. or whatever? I mean, I'm, I'm from New York, so we don't talk to our neighbors, but in <laughs> other places, you know, and I feel like this woman doing this, she has to sleep with one eye open now. Cause they have to come back at her. But that's the thing. Like she, <laughs> but I'm she's, Sicilian, seems so like I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> she thrives on that shit. Like the lengths yeah. I will go to keep the peace with the people around me. Oh, and yeah. you know my neighborhood. Yeah. It is it, it is a 24-hour day job. Yeah. All right. Let's bring it home, Gina Grad. <laughs> you got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. You stop and pull your dick out. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. All right. Denver going to be doing some live shows tomorrow and Saturday. Comedy Works South. Go there and uh, say hi. Dickie Barrett's going to be there. Kyle Dunnigan's going to be on the Saturday show. Thomas Jane, murder at Yellowstone City in theaters and VOD tomorrow as you hear this. Um, and Hannah Burner, everyone, the podcast. Burning in Hells and Giggly Squad. If I got that right. And uh, where should we go if we want to find all your dates? Oh, yeah. HannahBurn.com. I'm doing LA, Tacoma, um, Wisconsin. Got some stuff coming up. Good on you. And until next time, Santa Corolla for Hannah Burner and Thomas Jane and Gina Grant and Ball Brian saying Mahalo. They take you on a full journey where, like, you're rooting for him, and then you're, like, really Very not rooting not for him. To. Yeah, like, you, at first you're like, this guy's fucking amazing for comedy, and so he's incredibly talented and then you're like oh my god he's a monster what was very interesting is how they showed little like seeds he was planting like he almost was 